Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the John Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, in Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard, and we're pleased to be co-hosting tonight's discussion with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance. This program is one of a series called Challenges to Democracy, organized by the Ash Center to mark the 10th anniversary. Guaranteeing America's right to vote is, of course, a challenge that is fundamental to our country and one that we continue to face today. Tonight, our panel will focus on the range of issues that impact the right to register and vote, including the efforts underway to both expand and restrict voting and registration. It is my privilege to introduce our moderator who will introduce our panel for this discussion, Professor Alexander Kazar. Mr. Kazar is a Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy here at Harvard. He is a leading expert on election reform, the history of democracies, and the history of poverty. His book, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, was named Best U.S. History Book by the American History Association and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Professor Kazar. Thanks, Maggie. And thanks to all of you for, for coming uh, and to our <coughs> distinguished guests. We're, we're gathered here really uh, for two somewhat contradictory reasons. The first, as I'm sure you know, is commemorative. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was a truly landmark piece of legislation. There's, a, there's lots of references to things as landmark pieces of legislation. This was a real landmark piece of legislation that contributed mightily to the enfranchisement of millions of African Americans in the South and later to protecting the voting rights of language minorities throughout the United States. It's thanks to the Voting Rights Act and some other things that happened in the 60s as well that the United States actually did achieve something close to universal suffrage, which was in 1970, not in 1790, as some historical accounts might suggest. The second reason we're here, which is a little bit at cross purposes, is that a critical part of the Voting Rights Act, the coverage formula and the preclearance provision, which I'm gonna say a few more words about, was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013 in the well-known case of Shelby versus Holder. The subject before us today and before us as a society as well as tonight at this event is what is to be done? What are the strategies for moving forward to strengthen and protect voting rights, not only in the wake of Shelby, but also in a political climate in which many states have been enacting procedural laws and requirements that place new obstacles most vividly, most well known are voter ID requirements in the path of many prospective voters. Before looking to the future, I, I, I'm gonna try to give something of a historical framing uh, to this discussion because these, these issues have unfortunately deep uh, historical roots. And let me begin by mentioning or pointing to the little noticed formal subtitle of the Voting Rights Act. It's called, you know, everyone talks about it, the Voting Rights Act. It has a subtitle underneath Voting Rights Act, which is an act to enforce the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and for other purposes. The 15th Amendment, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, declared that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States uh, or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The 15th Amendment was ratified and became the law of the land in 1870, 95 years before the Voting Rights Act. So what we, what we have, what the Voting Rights Act is, is a piece of legislation designed to enforce a constitutional provision that had already been on the books for nearly a century. Now that provision was enforced briefly after the Civil War uh, in the presence of Northern troops uh, in, in the South. And African Americans are actively engaged in political life in the South from the late 1960s, depending on the state, until the mid to late 1890s. But that begins to change in the 1870s and 1880s when a combination of violence and, and a long series of legal devices uh, 
led to the wholesale disfranchisement of African Americans. It's important to note, I mean, it's a, there's one historical point that, uh, about the history of the right to vote that is, I think is worth really keeping in mind, uh, is that th this is, what happened in the late 19th century is one of numerous instances when the right to vote was narrowed. The history of the franchise in the United States is not a history of continuous expansion. It's a history of expansions followed by counterattacks um, and efforts to prevent people from voting. There are different time periods, and you can see this clearly. We are almost certainly in one of those time periods again now. In response to the massive disenfranchisement in the southern states, Congress in 1890, interestingly, and actually it was Republicans in Congress, but they, they, they were very different Republicans. Uh, Cong uh, Congress in 1890 considered renewed federal intervention to protect voting rights, but in the end it declined to act by a very, very narrow vote. They actually lost a cloture vote in the Senate by just a few votes. And, African, and the federal government effectively withdrew, and African Americans remained voteless and politically powerless for many decades. The Voting Rights Act, the point of this longer framework is that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was designed not to respond particularly to the conditions of the 1960s, but to conditions that had prevailed for a century. The legislation, the Voting Rights Act, but celebrated in many respects, was fiercely opposed in the 1960s in, ma in many quarters. Uh, the politicians, anybody who supported the Voting Rights Act was a communist. Um, it, pa it got passed a cloture vote in the Senate very narrowly, just by a few votes. But it was a, very, it was a carefully thought out, multi-pronged effort to use the power of the federal government to enforce the 15th Amendment and to permit African Americans to register and to vote. And it worked. Millions of people who had not been able to vote uh, were, were, became able to vote. One of the key prongs to this legislation was Section 5, the preclearance provision. Although it did not attract a lot of attention in the very beginning, what Section 5 was designed to do was to prevent states and counties from changing their voting laws uh, and electoral procedures in ways that might be discriminatory after those states had been obliged by the federal government to permit African Americans to register. It was to permit maneuvers, strategies. Okay, now we have to enfranchise African Americans, but we can change district line, change procedures, and still maintain discrimination. Any such changes uh, had to be approved by the Justice Department or by a federal court. That's what preclearance was. To limit its intrusiveness in some ways throughout the country, it was made applicable only to those jurisdictions with a discernible history and pattern of discrimination. That was the coverage formula which was spelled out in section four. It was section four that a narrow majority of the Supreme Court tossed out in Shelby versus Holder on the grounds that the coverage formula was no longer reasonable uh, or appropriate, some of you may remember um, just, you know, Justice Ginsburg's comment that getting rid of Section 4 and Section 5 um, was like uh, walking out in the rain and taking down your umbrella because you hadn't been getting wet. Um, and without Section 4, which is now gone, or which, is, which is the, the court basically said Congress has to create a new Section 4, um, the preclearance provision uh, became inoperable. The federal government, as a result of that decision, lost what for decades had been a key weapon in preventing states from passing voting or election laws um, that were discriminatory. Indeed, within hours of the court decision, the state of Texas reinstituted restrictive laws that had been subject to preclearance. And literally within hours, this is not uh, metaphorical. And since then, other states have followed. That, in very brief, is where we are today. And our two distinguished speakers have been at the forefront of trying to develop strategies to respond to this new legal and political situation. Penda Hare is a graduate of Harvard Law School who then clerked at the Supreme Court. He's been a longtime advocate of civil and political rights. He was the director of the Washington office of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. In 1999, she co-founded Advancement Project 
as an innovative racial justice organization to help eradicate structural inequities that threaten the democratic process. Uh, Advancement, Pro Advancement Project has been devoted to developing both community-based campaigns and legal strategies. It's had notable, a, a long string of notable successes, including in producing election reform in Florida, campaigning for the restoration of, of voting rights to ex-felons in Virginia, and securing voting rights uh, for people displaced by Hurricane Katrina. At Advancement Project, uh, Penda manages a team of voting rights attorneys and has been centrally involved in numerous important cases, some of which you will hear about tonight. Congressman Robert C. Bobby Scott is currently serving his 12th term in Congress and is the ranking member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce. He, his, his, his election record is, uh, I mean, I, I was looking at, at some of the numbers, but I think most of the time you've been reelected with 75% of the vote and, la and last year you ran unopposed, uh, <laughs> suggesting some serious support. Uh, prior to serving in the House of Representatives, he served in the Virginia House of Delegates uh, and in the Senate of Virginia from 1983 to 1993. Among his many achievements and notable positions in Congress, he's been a key advocate of increases in the minimum wage of criminal justice and sentencing reform, eliminating anti-gay bias, extending unemployment benefits, and opposing the Patriot Act and uh, the war in Iraq. Congressman Scott has the distinction of being the first African-American elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Virginia since Reconstruction, and only the second African-American elected to Congress in Virginia's history. He also holds the lesser distinction of being the only one of my college roommates ever elected to office. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, a, as a member of the House Judiciary Committee, Congressman Scott was one of the co-sponsors of the Voting Rights Amendments Act, which is legislation, the Voting Rights Amendments Act was legislation designed to respond to the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby um, by developing a new coverage formula. That effort does not seem to be enthusiastically supported by the Republican majority um, in the House, but you will hear more about that from him. At this point, I'm going to sort of launch the discussion by asking questions uh, to each of our speakers. I'll, I'll ask uh, perhaps three to, uh, to each of them, give them a chance really to say um, what, 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 what they, what they want to say, and at the end of that time, we will open this up to a discussion from the floor. So, Congressman Scott, let me begin with you, which is, can you tell us, what can you tell us about the Voting Rights Amendments Act, kind of what is it, and do you think it has any chance of passage in the foreseeable future? Well, thank you, Alex, and it's certainly a pleasure uh, to be here, and I noticed Kay Hagan back in the back, Senator from, um, former Senator from North Carolina, it's good to see you again. Good, thank you. Um, you, you know, one thing that um, you didn't, go into is how effective the voter suppression was. And the movie Selma, uh, which I recommend to everybody, goes into detail about how, um, how bad things were and how open and notorious the denial of the ro right to vote was. The Supreme Court um, mentioned in before the Voting Rights Act, just before, in a, in, in a case that other rights, talking about voting rights, other rights, even the most basic, are illusory that the right to vote is undermined. And you can see how Sheriff Clark got elected. And that's how democracy was working when some people um, can't vote. Uh, in Virginia, before the Voting Rights Act, um, there were zero African Americans in the state legislature, zero judges. Uh, I got elected to the state house in 77, and at that point there was just one black in the house and one in the Senate. Um, now there are about 18. There were zero judges as late as uh, in the early 70s, and now there are at least 50 j uh, judges at various levels in the Commonwealth of Virginia. From the city councils, school board. My father was uh, appointed to the Nupanu School Board in the 1950s. And as a political achievement, that took, that was a bigger deal than me getting elected to Congress because the suppression was just that, um, uh, that effective. Section 5 worked. Uh, because of Section 5, the um, um, legislators had no incentive 
to try to continue to deny people the right to vote. The section two, where you can actually affirmatively sue, uh, can improve things, but section five kept things from getting worse because any law change had to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department. The burden of proof was on the state to prove it was not discriminatory. And so without section five, uh, all of the uh, uh, localities, all of the states had an incentive had a, were rewarded for cheating. You put up some little um, uh, law that kept people from voting, it would help you get elected, you would get to serve, you would get to spend people's money. When, uh, when the victims of the discrimination finally raised enough money to get you into court, and after weeks and months and maybe years, uh, were able to get the law that allowed you to get elected overturned, then you get to run as, a, as an incumbent with all the influence of incumbency. So you get rewarded for cheating. And as soon as that case is over, you can start up again. Cheat again, win an, win, win an election. What Section 5 did was put an end to that. Um, previously, if you were the victim of discrimination, if you couldn't raise enough money to get into court, you were just stuck with the new change. Now, the burden of proof and all the expense in going forward is on the state to prove it is not discriminatory. And that has prevented, over these years, since 1965, new laws, new discriminatory laws are being passed. Uh, Alex mentioned the day of the decision. Uh, from several states, you heard people say, now we can pass these laws. A statement that would make no sense unless you assumed that they knew they couldn't get passed by the Justice Department as being not discriminatory. They knew. And they passed, and they started passing laws uh, along those lines. And so the um, um, uh, Section 4, all of the states weren't covered by Section 5. Only certain states were. And um, older people will recognize the commercial where, um, for the younger people, you've never seen it before, but there's a commercial way back when Alex and I were in college where a guy in an investment firm comes in and shows that they make money fairly and, and ends the commercial by saying, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. <laughs> now, older people have heard it. Younger people have never heard it. But that's what happens in Section 5. People say, well, it's unfair to get covered. No. You got covered the old-fashioned way. You had poll taxes, literacy tests, voter suppression, low voter turnout. And so you earned the coverage. And now they're free to do what they had been doing all along. We have, um, in order to restore as much of the Voting Rights Act as we think we can restore in light of the Shelby decision, we have a little bill that everybody has criticized. And when they say it's not strong enough, I say, well, you're exactly right. We lost the case. This is, the, we think, the best you can, you can do under the, under the case. And the Republicans won't even have a hearing on it, uh, won't move forward. And um, uh, so I don't know, in terms of prospects, I don't know what the prospects are. But at some point, people are going to have to use the right that's left, in spite of all the newfound schemes and, uh, and, and whatnot to suppress the vote, uh, to get out and vote and put people in office who will actually restore it. Uh, until then, the Republicans are in control of both the House and the Senate and have just refused to even bring it up for a vote. There is a real Voting Rights Act bill pending, <laughs> one that strengthens voting rights. We're not talking about that one. We're talking about a little Voting Rights Act amendment to uh, restore some of what we had prior to the Shelby decision. Thanks. Uh, Pender, um, picking up where Bobby concluded, which is that it seems, it seems unlikely that the preclearance provision is going to be restored, um, that even the very modest proposal which, uh, uh, of the new Section 4, which was in effect a bail-in proposal, states will become covered only if they committed uh, certain kinds of violations. But in the absence, it looks like that's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. So what are the legal options or strategies that are available to protect voting rights? Um, and how, how effective can they be? Well, let me, let me start by putting, um, putting that question in a, in a little context. Um, both of you have, have, um, have uh, provided a lot of the history 
And I just want to talk a, a, about the states that were previously covered by Section 5. Most of those states were former slave states. You start with Virginia, you go to North Carolina, which had 40 counties covered, South Carolina, Florida had five counties covered, Alabama, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana were fully covered, Texas, and those were the states, and those still are the states, if you, if you look at the southern United States, where people of color are concentrated, um, African Americans primarily um, in the south, and then um, uh, Latinos in the southwest. And those are the states that primarily were at stake when, when Section 5 was eviscerated by the Supreme Court. And, those, and, and the political significance of those states are, I believe, that if voters of color were able to fully participate and vote in those states, um, and, uh, and, they, and they were able to join with enough allies who are white, um, and, and I believe that as the uh, population is changing, those, that, that kind of coalition is possible, then um, those states can elect progressives instead of the regressives that they mostly elect and send to, and, and, and send to Congress with a few exceptions. <laughs> um, and, and, you would, and you could change the political sort of landscape of the United States if you could change voting rights in those cases, that, in those states. That's the political significance. Uh, and, and, and it's true, you know, they're trying to suppress the vote in places like Wisconsin and Ohio that aren't in the South, but particularly in the South, um, this has been the history, you know, since the Civil War. And so I'm going to point out a few sort of more modern day, um, what I call landmark dates. One is, it's already been mentioned, the 1965 was the uh, passage of the Voting Rights Act. Um, then the Voting Rights Act was amended in 1982. And I'm going to get to Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which is the nationwide provision that's been mentioned. That provision was amended in 1982, and Congress added uh, what's been called the results test. Until then, the Voting Rights Act had been interpreted by the Supreme Court to require that you prove racial intent, racial, essentially racial animus or racial prejudice in order to establish a violation. But, and um, the, uh, the amendment to Section 2 was in response to a case called um, Mobile v. Bolden, where um, the, it was pretty clear that there, was, that there was intent, but the lower courts had not found it. And the Supreme Court said, well, then you don't have a cause of action. So Congress said, we need to have a test that codifies a definition of discrimination that doesn't uh, uh, turn on having to prove intent, which is proving somebody's intent is uh, legislature's intent is very difficult. So after section, after 1982, there were a lot of section two cases. And, um, and many of them were successful, many of them were, were settled, covering um, all sorts of issues. Um, probably the primary, the, the, the largest number were redistricting cases, just because redistricting is done every 10 years and it covers it, it, every district line in the states are changed, and so there's a lot of, a, a lot of possibilities for shenanigans that Section 2 uh, was used in the non-Section 5 states to address. But Section 2 also applied to everything from moving a polling place to voter registration restrictions um, the, the, across the board. So after uh, Section 5 was um, uh, at least temporarily and maybe permanently <laughs> sort of eliminated, um, um, uh, Section 2 became, I would say, one of the primary legal uh, litigation approaches. And so um, uh, plaintiffs' groups, the NAACP, the LULAC, uh, League of Women Voters, lots of groups that work to enfranchise voters brought lawsuits represented by lawyers like me and other voting rights lawyers to challenge uh, the new voter restrictions um, based on Section 2. And those cases are working their way through the courts. Um, I believe that Section 2 clearly applies to the types of voter suppression measures that we are seeing today. Um, Advancement Project, the first case that we were involved in was actually the Texas, we were involved in the Section 5 process. So the one of the first states to enact one of these 
um, mod, uh, uh, current voter restrictions was Texas, which enacted a very, very uh, strict voter ID. And um, they were first barred by Section 5. The Justice Department refused to preclear it. Then uh, the, the Texas went to court to try to override that. The court sided with the Department of Justice and said, no, this is, violates Section 5. And Texas was barred from using its very strict photo ID because it was found to discriminate. Then the Supreme Court decides the Shelby case and was mentioned on the same day, the Attorney General of Texas says, now we're going to um, uh, bring back our voter ID. We're going to start implementing it. So uh, uh, um, folks in Texas sued under Section 2, and this past fall won a, a very, very strong district court opinion um, where um, the, uh, the photo ID law was found to, to violate Section 2 because of its adverse impact on African Americans and Latinos and because of the other factors that are identified under Section 2, such as a history of discrimination, um, socioeconomic uh, disparities that are directly related to your ability to participate in the political process, those kind of factors are the kinds of factors that apply under the results test. So that case then went to the, uh, ultimately to the Supreme Court, which stayed the, the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court stayed the uh, injunction, so Texas was allowed to, um, to implement its photo ID this fall. I was involved in a similar case in North Carolina. North Carolina, the legislature uh, waited maybe six weeks, maybe four weeks after Shelby, and then enacted what we call the monster voter suppression law, because in addition to having a, 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 a very similar, very, very strict photo ID requirement, which is slated to go into effect in 2016, the legislature also took away um, seven days, one week of early voting. It took away uh, the pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, which just meant you, you filed your form and it was on, it was kept, and then when you turned 18, it was processed. They took that away. And they took away same-day registration, which is a very innovative uh, um, mechanism that North Carolina had enacted um, in 2007 that had really allowed voter registration to expand and, and um, uh, led to African Americans for the first time in modern history participating at the same rate as whites in North Carolina. They took, wiped out same-day registration. So all of those we challenged um, last summer in a preliminary injunction hearing and um, 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 put on massive evidence. The um, other side put on no evidence, called not a single witness. But nonetheless, the judge ruled for the state, denied the preliminary injunction. Um, we appealed to the Fourth Circuit where we won, and the Fourth Circuit held that they needed to bring back same-day registration and they needed to um, bring back the early voting days. The photo ID has not been addressed yet. And that case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court stayed the Fourth Circuit injunction, and essentially we lost again. We, we lost, we won, and then we lost. Um, and that's sort of been the way that these cases are going, but the Supreme Court's actions have not reached the merits yet. All they're doing is sort of freezing the case until uh, there's an opportunity to reach the merit. So just really quickly, a third case that we're involved in, Wisconsin, um, is, is currently in the Supreme Court on a, on a cert petition that we filed asking review uh, on the merits of that state's photo ID. And again, we won at the district court. We, uh, it's sort of reverse of North Carolina. We won at the district court. We lost in the Seventh Circuit. And then the Supreme Court actually ruled in our favor <laughs> on the stay in that case and um, stopped Wisconsin's photo ID from going into effect in this past election. But essentially, all of these cases are working their way to the Supreme Court where I believe that before 2016, we will have uh, a decision that um, tells us exactly or how, or at least provides more guidance on how Section 2 is going to be applied in the post shall be situation. Oh, thank you. You covered a lot of ground. Um, Congress, Congressman, uh, I, I know I can't really ask you to be um, an expert in explaining the motivations of people on the other side of the aisle in Congress, but I'm going to kind of do that to you anyway, which is, 
to, to ask why, in your view, do you think uh, the Republicans have been so reluctant to embrace a new non-regional version of some kind of coverage formula? Um, I mean, a way of a another way of asking that is the protection of voting rights, uh, which you know we sit here in this room, or, uh, you know, and I presume most people in this room, certainly three of us up here, you know, protecting voting rights seems like uh, like a good thing, right? I mean, you know, we see, we, um, but is protecting voting rights politically unpopular? Uh, is it you know, is, are there places where people say no, we don't want to protect voting rights? I mean, and as I recall, even your your former colleague, the the much missed Eric Cantor um, actually thought that the, Republican, that the Republicans in Congress should try to deal with, with something like a coverage formula, that it, that it would be in their political interest to, to, to develop something, however minor and tepid. So I'm a little puzzled by the politics of it. I, I, I got to tell you, I was surprised too. The, the, the bill <laughs> is so modest. I mean, it, it, you, you almost feel embarrassed fighting for it. <laughs> uh, now, the, 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 the voting rights bill, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, has a lot of good stuff in it. Early voting, mail-in ballots, um, no voter ID, I mean, a lot, all the good stuff in it. I mean, that's worth fighting for. This little thing is so modest that I, I honestly believed that they would kind of run it through a committee, voice vote in the House, Senate would pick it up and pass it, send it to the President. I mean, it's, it's very modest. And I, I, you know, we, we were low key and, you know, just let it pass that we did not expect any, any, frankly, any resistance to this little modest bill. And for them not to even hold a hearing. Um, and you ask, who are we dealing with? Um, one of my colleagues got in a little squabble because somebody found out that he attended a David Duke function about 12 years ago. Um, for those of you who want to go back in history, David Duke himself uh, ran for governor and received an overwhelming portion of the white vote, about two-thirds, himself. Um, I mean, for those that don't recognize the name, I don't know what his office was, but he's uh, does not deny being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, two thirds of the white vote. They did uh, Mississippi, um, excuse me, South Carolina and Alabama in 1998 and 2000 had a referendum to take to amend their constitution to allow blacks and whites to marry. Now that prohibition in their constitution wasn't enforced because the Supreme Court had already ruled on it in the 1960s. But um, almost 40 percent in those two states voted against it. Uh, they did a poll three years ago in, um, in Alabama and Mississippi and about one out of four voters in the, in the Republican primary in 2012 said that blacks, Mary, and whites ought to be illegal. And so you ask, where are they on voting rights? Um, you know, they, they ought to show that this is not who they are represented. And they have not availed themselves of that opportunity to show that that's not who they represent. And, um, and so that's what we're dealing with. Um, not even having a hearing. I think if it came to a vote, um, it would, my view is that it, it would pass on a voice vote that you know, just let it pass. Um, but the fact that the leadership representing their party, now leadership doesn't, they don't make these decisions by themselves. I mean, they talk to guys, you get a consensus, and leadership just announces it. Not to have a hearing, not even a hearing, um, it just represents. Um, uh, recalcitrance that uh, I've been in politics since the 19 the elected official since 1970s. Even in the Virginia legislature, I served with people who actually voted in favor of what was called massive resistance. That is, when the Supreme Court said you got to integrate 
if you have a school system that has to be integrated, they said, they only looked at one word, if. And they closed the schools rather than integrate it. They rather than integrate it. I've served in the General Assembly with people that voted for it. One, when I was serving with them, said he doesn't regret the vote. Um, you know, so even with that history, I'm surprised that we haven't even had a history. And, and so it just means that we have to do more to get the vote out to elect people that have a different view. What you're saying is bringing to mind you know, the, the famous line from Faulkner that uh, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. <laughs> right. uh -oh. um, Penda, a, a question moving in a slightly different direction for you, but both you and I have at different times been very strong supporters of a constitutional amendment uh, to guarantee an affirmative right to vote in the United States. For those of you who may be new to these discussions, take a look at your constitution. There is no affirmative right to vote in there. Uh, it's, just, it's just not there. Um, and such an amendment uh, this year and last year has been uh, introduced into congressmen, by Congressman Ellison and, and Pocon. Um, do, you, do you have any hopes that this can actually win or uh, or help move things forward? Um, I do have hope. Um, um, maybe not so much in um, uh, getting the Constitution amended anytime soon, but um, we, we at Advancement Project and others that have been looking at the issue so, sort of started asking the question, what would be the structural solution that would eliminate um, all of the different uh, problems that keep popping up. And Section 5 in the preclearance was really enacted because um, what was happening is that every time uh, uh, um, uh, uh, lawyers would sue and stop one method of making voting harder, the, the state or local uh, governments would just do something else. And that's continuing to happen. We have 13,000 different jurisdictions in this country that make voting rules, everything from from the times that the polls are open to um, where the po polling places are located and all sorts of rules. How do you count provisional ballots? And there's all sorts of, of, of variation. In some states you can register on election day and vote the same day. In other states you have to register 30 days in advance. And so if we could have a nation, na national uh, minimal standards, it would, First of all, it would make it more fair across the states, and second, it would, it would provide a higher level of judicial scrutiny of any, uh, any voting practices that uh, bar people uh, from, from voting, that burden exercise their right to vote. So for example, in Missouri, where the state constitution has a fundamental right to vote provision, the, uh, the legislature enacted a strict photo ID requirement and it was struck down by the Missouri Supreme Court on the ground that it violated the state constitution. Last year, or two years ago in Pennsylvania, Advancement Project was involved in a case that we brought challenging that state's new photo ID law under the state constitution. And again, there's a specific fundamental right to vote uh, protection in that state's constitution, and we won that case. The Supreme Court of Pennsylvania found that the, the uh, photo ID um, was an unreasonable burden on the, on the right to vote. So what, a, fundam what, what a, a, a constitutional provision would do is it would uh, make voting subject to the same type of, of constitutional review as we, we now give to like the First Amendment free speech rights. Like you cannot burden the right to speak uh, freely unless you have a compelling interest. And, and the Supreme Court has f applied a lower standard to voting even than to the First Amendment. And um, you know, we, we sometimes say that um, guns get more protection in this country than the right to vote gets um, because of the Second Amendment. Um, so we know it's, an, uh, it's a long road to getting a federal constitutional amendment, um, but we think that it also allows advocates to, t to uh, take the offense 
And we are on the defense right now. We are being hit from all sides of, of various uh, mechanisms for making voting harder. And so part of what uh, a campaign to amend the Constitution would do would be to allow advocates really to go on the offense and be able to say, why shouldn't we have this? It's what you said, voting should be protected. It's, and, and actually, um, polling and uh, other public opinion research that we and lots of other people have done show that it is overwhelmingly popular. People think they already have the right to vote, and when they find out they don't, they want it. So, um, and th the way that this could be pursued in the short run might be to try to amend other state constitutions and build some momentum, and especially states that, that allow ballot initiatives, like Florida, for example, if you get enough signatures, or Ohio, you can get an initiative put on the ballot that is sort of a, a, a way to get around the legislatures when they, when they hold up um, uh, provisions going through the legislature. So that's one option that, that we're looking at in some states. Thank you. I think what I'm going to do at this point is to hold on my thir third question. I have third and potential fourth question and open the floor um, to, uh, to, to you folks who have been sitting here very, uh, very respectfully. Um, there are four microphones, I think, scattered around uh, in the usual places. Um, and so if you go to a microphone, you can, you, can, you can ask a question. There are ground rules. Some, all of you who are familiar with the forum will know what the ground rules are for asking a question. The first is that all questioners must identify themselves. The second is there is only one question, per, one brief question per person, and the reminder that questions, unlike speeches, end with question marks. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so uh, let me start there. Uh, hello, my name is Jordan. I'm a sophomore at the college. And one of my questions is that earlier you mentioned that one of the groups that is being suppressed is Latinos, but we also know that that's one of the fastest growing groups and that right now both parties are trying very hard to get that vote in the future, and I'm sure that will be a fundamental demographic that will be needed. So let's say that demographic were to start to lean right per se. Do you think the debate over voting rights and the suppression of Latinos would continue if that group started to change the party that they voted for? Well, it, for, first of all, we have to remind ourselves that uh, the strategy is not to deny anyone the right to vote. It's just suppression. So you'd have less, uh, for, for people, um, for English, not the uh, initial language, you have stuff printed in other languages. Th think that would be encouraging people to vote. So you would have much less of that. But I mean, the, the strategy, I mean, I, th I think if you look at all of the issues, this fall, voter suppression would fall right into it. Look at what's hap going on with immigration um, and voting rights and everything else. I think the fairly um, uh, education, um, we, we, we'd be doing no child left behind, uh, renewing that. And one of the things that the committee has voted, the Republican-dominated committee, has voted to do is uh, strip the direct support for um, English as a, as a second language students, stuff that usually gets left out. So I mean, if you look at an array of issues, um, it, it seems to me that the idea that uh, Hispanics ought to be voting Republican um, doesn't make a lot of sense. So what I would say is that um, voter suppression um, and attacks on voting rights, um, I believe, are a complex mixture of racial uh, uh, discrimination and partisanship. And clearly, both motives are, are present. And, um, um, and what we're seeing in this latest round is uh, targeting African Americans and other uh, people covered by the Voting Rights Act for partisan motives, we think, in many cases. And so if, the, if those groups voted differently, maybe they wouldn't be targeted, but there also is, and it, it violates the Voting Rights Act. If you target a particular group in order to achieve a partisan goal, and that group is protected by the v Voting Rights Act, that still is a violation of the Voting Rights Act. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated mixture, but race has always been at the center of it. 
And um, so I would suspect that uh, some measure of voting discrimination will continue to occur as long as racism is not wiped out in this country. Thank you. If I may add, before moving on to the next question, as somebody who spent a lot of years studying the history of voting rights throughout the United States over 200 years, I can report that there has never been an attempt to disenfranchise upper middle class white males. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Marcus Dennis. I'm a freshman at the college. And kind of in a similar vein, I know that um, lately gerrymandering and redistricting, redistricting has had a very similar effect on uh, politics today. And so as a litigator and as a legislator, how has that ch uh, changed the political environment and how have you guys gone about it and approaching it? I would say the same is true uh, essentially uh, of redistricting, which is that there has, uh, since, the voting, since the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, there, the, the drawing of the district lines has again been a complicated interaction of race and partisanship. And I tried a case in Texas in the 1990s where whites were challenging districts that were drawn uh, in order to allow African Americans and Latinos to elect their, the candidates of their choice. That is that they, the districts were drawn in a way to keep that population together where, where it was strong enough if it was together to elect the candidates of, uh, of their choice. And whites were, were claiming that that was racial gerrymandering. And, and, and now what we're seeing though, so, uh, um, and, uh, and now what we're seeing in some, in some states though is um, that African Americans or Latinos or other racial groups are being packed into districts in order to achieve a partisan advantage because if you pack more Democrats into a district than is needed to elect the candidate of choice of those voters, then you keep those voters out of other districts where they might have an impact. And I know that in North Carolina and Alabama, there are cases going through the courts right now challenging that. The um, litigation on gerrymandering changes every 10 years. And part of it is because of the Voting Rights Act has enabled African Americans to vote. Um, right after the Voting Rights Act, because so few were registered to vote, you needed in many areas, about 60% or more African Americans in, in, in uh, population in order to expect the African American community to be able to elect a candidate of its choice. As time went on, as time has gone on and more people are registered to vote and political sophistication is, is uh, taking place, well let me say first, e all of redistricting is locally based. Some schemes that hurt you in one area will help you in another. So you can't, the, you can have generalities, uh, but you gotta be careful because generalities might not apply. But as you've gone on, it's occurred to people that the 60 and 65% districts that you may have needed in 1960 and 1970 are what are called overpacked. Um, you could elect candidates of your choice at 55, 50, in some areas 40%, the community can easily elect a candidate of its choice, depending on the on the area. And by in my district is under litigation now. It's the court lower court has thrown it out as a district that's overpacked. They put in a lot more. They, they intentionally found African Americans and stuck them in my district, way over the um, uh, number necessary. And the court found that it was race was a predominant factor and that it was unnecessary. It, it, as she said, if uh, under a constitutional um, uh, consideration, you can't use race as a major factor in doing it unless you have a compelling state interest and your remedy is narrowly tailored to address that in interest. They said it was because of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, which was in effect, but they went over what Section 5 required and it made the four districts surrounding my district fairly safe Republican by overpacking my district. Now the same kind of phenomenon, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, all districts that Obama carried twice, North Carolina carried once, lost once, so it's 50-50. In all of those, the congressional delegation 
is overwhelmingly Republican. In uh, Virginia, eight Republicans, three Democrats in a state that Obama carried twice because of, primarily because of racial uh, packing. You put all the African Americans in one district and the others become more Republican. Um, that is gonna be, I think, the next step, dealing with um, racial gerrymandering to have fair districts so when a state delegation is formed, um, it more closely represents the state rather than um, uh, what the majority of the Republicans in the legislature have been able to do. Now, I, I gotta confess, when I was in the General Assembly with a Democratic House, Senate, and Governor, we had a fairly mean-spirited uh, <laughs> uh, gerrymander from a partisan perspective. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't come with this with clean hands. I, I'm guilty. <laughs> uh, having done that, Republicans have gotten done it twice to us. So, so you, you know, let's get back to even. <laughs> uh, but I think that, that problem in all those states where you have um, such severe gerrymandering going on, uh, it has resulted in, 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 in a situation where on a national vote, Democrats, one number I heard was has to win by six percentage points in order to take over the House. You have to, not just the majority of the vote, 50, over, fi over 50 percent, almost, you have to get, win by about six points in order to have enough votes to win a majority of the seats. Um, I think there's something wrong with that and dealing with that uh, in a constitutional framework with all the litigation is I think the uh, next round of, uh, of, of concern. It's, um, we're doing that now in Virginia. Um, and li like I said, y you have to be very careful on redistricting because some generalities that work in one area do not apply to others. And when you talk about what kind of threshold you need to elect for the minority community to elect a candidate of its choice, uh, that varies to a large extent the political sophistication, the level of voter registration, but also what the rest of it. If you've got a liberal area, it's easier. If you have a very conservative area, it's harder. So what that threshold is cannot be generalized. Thank you. A question up there. Hi, I'm Ignacio. I'm a freshman at the college. My question is related to the Latino discussion you were having previously. I'm from Puerto Rico, which means that I'm an American citizen which means that I, we pay American taxes and we can get drafted in the military. But it also means we have one non-voting representative in Congress, and it also means I can't vote for the President of the United States. I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts were on the matter and what do you think the future is for Puerto Rico? Um, I think one of the first things, you have to have a definitive position from Puerto Rico as to what Puerto Rico wants as a status, and that's been kind of going back and forth. Um, when you get a, and, and Washington, D.C. is almost in the same position. They can vote for president, but have no voting representation in, con in Congress. Um, and I think they are coming to the consensus um, for statehood, and it would be very helpful if Puerto Rico made a decision one way or the other. Every time you send a new uh, resident commissioner, I think is a technical term, a member of Congress, they come with a different position. Um, so, and that's been, um, that's hurt the ability to do anything. But um, I, it, it seems to me that there are the citizens' um, statehood would be a uh, reasonable position to take. Whether you could pass it with the partisan situation you've got uh, in Congress, because the likelihood is it'd be two Democratic senators and several Democratic representatives. Uh, whether you can get something like that passed through a Republican legislature is problematic. Um, I'm Sonia Carabell. I'm a freshman at the college also. And uh, you've both been talking a lot about voter suppression, gerrymandering, but um, I was wondering about a group of people who is legally disenfranchised, which would be um, former convicts and people currently in prisons. So um, do you have any thoughts on that subject? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> yes, and, and that it's not true in every state. 
that people with felony conviction, that it's one of those, it's, remember I said we had 13,000 voting jurisdictions? Well, of the, of the, of the states, um, they, the state decides what the rule is for people with felony convictions being able to vote because the federal government, even in federal elections, has ceded to the states the ability to, to, to make the rules for voting. So in Virginia, for example, where Advancement Project has been working for almost 10 years, to, it is, one of the, is one of the most uh, severe and, and basically has a permanent disenfranchisement for people with felony convictions. And so we've been, it's been gradually being opened up through actions by the governors um, each, each governor of the past three governors has, has uh, um, um, used his or her, his, his clemency power to allow more people with felony convictions to uh, be able to get their right to vote back. Um, but um, it still, it, it requires individual, and a, a individual act clemency by the governor in order to, to do that. Kentucky is another state that has a, a permanent ban on voting. Other states, such as Texas, for example, you can, um, as soon as you, if you, if you finished your um, sentence and paid your fines, you can re-register and vote. And um, one of the problems in Florida after the 2000 election we discovered is that they had made a list of people to be purged and they had included on it a lot of people who had felony convictions from Texas, but in fact those people were allowed to vote because Texas did not disenfranchise it. We could talk forever about the Florida 2000 election, but that's just one little sub-fact. One of the problems with that is that the Constitution specifically allows disenfranchisement for a crime. Um, you, you can't discriminate against people except for crime. Now there's a word other than that. You may argue about what kind of crime it is, but everybody's interpreted it as a felony. Um, and so it's allowed, as um, Tender said, um, um, Virginia has a permanent disability. Each governor's done a lot more. And this governor has, within a couple of months, done more in about a year, he, about a year and a half, he probably would have done more than any governor in history. Each has done a little better. But if you look at the numbers, there are hundreds of thousands disenfranchised, and you're talking single digit thousands being, um, um, uh, yeah, having their rights restored. I'm not sure we're doing, restoring as many as new felonies coming in. Um, so we have, we've got a lot of work to do, um, but under our state constitution, um, that's just the way it is. And our constitutional amendment process would require a um, vote in the House and Senate twice with an election in between, and it goes to the voters. Well, that happened when I was in the House of Delegates. They voted to give the legislature the right to you know, have an expedited process. There was no visible opposition to the referendum. And when a vote, and, and all the editorial boards before it, all the groups before it, when the vote came down, it lost three to one. People went in and saw the question, shall we do something good for felons? And the answer was no. Um, so uh, the idea that you can get anything through the constitutional amendment process is problematic, uh, but the governors are being much more and more aggressive trying to restore rights. And so I think we're gonna continue pursuing uh, that option. I'll just add one note about, to make this more local so we don't think of this as something just in the South, but um, Massachusetts, and some, uh, very f relatively few people in this room are old enough to remember this, but Massachusetts did not disfranchise felons at all until the late 1990s. And what happened at that point was that a prisoner's rights group got organized and was trying to, uh, and was actually lobbying to improve conditions in the prison. And at that, at that point, <laughs> the governor responded by um, initiating you know, an effort to disfranchise uh, fe felons and ex-felons, which passed overwhelmingly in a referendum here in the great state of Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Sarah Feldman. I'm from North Carolina. Um, and I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is, while we're waiting for these court decisions and these laws that are facing opposition just not coming, what can we do in the meantime? Like, should we be 
driving people to the DMV and getting IDs, it just, it just feels frustrating waiting for the top-down things to happen, so what can we do now? One thing is that um, no one is being denied the right to vote. It's just being suppressed. You put all these little roadblocks and speed bumps in the way, and you figure out of every thousand, some people just not gonna, not gonna do it. When you talk about voter ID, you know, the majority, the majority, every, every kind of decides the reasonableness of a voter ID on whether I have one. I have a driver's license, so I guess that's reasonable. If you look at it at the other side, suppose somebody said, well, you need a food stamp ID to vote. And people would say, well, that's absurd. Well, no, you can go cross town, stand in line, and get one. It's free. And you still think that's absurd. Well, that's what people without a driver's license think about the discussion. They don't have one, and they don't want to go cross town and stand in line to have one. When people talk about the voter ID laws, I think you got to, it, it is obviously skewed by income. Those that don't have enough money to own a car are much less likely to have a driver's license. So, I mean, they're, they're, you, you have a demographic that's been, been hit, and everybody knows that they are more likely to be Democrat than Republican. And so, when you ta start talking about you need these voter ID to combat voter fraud, most of the people, there may be some that are telling the truth, but most of it is partisan politics, plain and simple. Uh, you got enough of them on tape. Uh, the chair of the Republican Party in Florida was on tape saying, I was in the room. It was all about denying the right to vote. didn't have anything to do with fraud. They got a guy, the Republican leader in Pennsylvania, caught on tape saying, about the things they've done, and a voter ID law that will allow Romney to carry the state. I mean, it's all politics, doesn't have anything to do with fraud. If, you, if, it, were, if it were fraud, there are a lot of other better targets in terms of, um, uh, in, in, in terms of fraud. Uh, Newt Gingrich was running for president, um, tried to get on the ballot. They found fraudulent signatures on his petitions. That could have, if he had gotten on the ballot, it would have had a profound impact on the outcome of the Republican, um, uh, uh, Republican primary because of the way they were distributing votes. Winner take all, you get them all, get, them, get a minority, then it's divided proportionally. Well, there are only, at that point, two people on the ballot. So Romney was going to get them all. If, if, if Gingrich had gotten on, there's a very good chance that Romney would have lost half the votes he got out of Virginia. Uh, n nothing said about petition fraud, nothing said about absentee ballot fraud, where people in nursing homes, somebody shows up with a handful of ballots from a nursing home. These people actually vote, I mean, the, when they say the cure is worse than the disease, uh, the handful of people, I mean, nobody, no, you can't find people that said they showed up to vote and misidentified themselves, fraudulently identified themselves. You don't, you don't ever hear that happening. So you're talking about single-digit problems, and the, and the cure is disenfranchise hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, so when they say that it's, there's just some sanctity to ballot going on, that, that is absolute not, that's absurd. Uh, it's all pure politics, and they're using the voter suppression for partisan political uh, reasons. Um, so we have to be careful when you, when you talk about what to do about it. Uh, they're not preventing anybody from voting. People ought to vote mad. Anybody that supports those things, um, we ought to consider that as to who you vote for. Uh, get out to vote, uh, although it is a little harder, although it's harder than it should be. Um, uh, we, I think we can defeat these things if we just turn out to vote. So many people aren't voting. I mean, we've got to make, at some point, you've got to make democracy work. And you get people in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, whining because the police force uh, was virtually all white in a community two-thirds black, you wonder how that happened because nobody voted. Um, and then, so democracy, you know, police force didn't fall from the sky. They were, came from the democratic process. And if you expect the process to work, people have to get out to vote. And with uh, all the speed bumps and problems, you just have to work harder. This is going to turn out to be the last question. So, Penda, you're going to get a chance to respond to Sarah's I think excellent question, which is what can we do, right? I mean, I, I 
I guess part of the answer is elect more like-minded people and donate to advancement projects. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I turn it over to I you. I mean, we're sort of in a, in a, in a, in a catch-22 situation, which may, may have been true throughout history, which is in order to get better laws of governing voting, you need to elect different people to legislatures and Congress, or you need to elect people who appoint judges who will um, decide lawsuits in favor of, of, of inclusion. And, and, and yet with the law, you know, with the, with the voting uh, laws essentially creating barriers, it makes it harder to turn out. But what I would say to you is the same thing that Congressman Scott said, which is yes, go out, take people to the DMV, take people to vote, go back to North Carolina <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and fight because ultimately uh, I think that it's going to be a combination of all of these uh, strategies that break open democracy and it's worth it. It's worth it to give, uh, to, to make the democracy open and accessible to everybody. I think those are very apt words on which to conclude our program, and let me thank uh, Congressman Scott and Penda Hare and all of you. Thank thank you. you. Thank you. Right. Good evening and welcome to the John Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Inst Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard, and we're pleased to be co-hosting tonight's discussion with the Ash Center for Democratic Governance. This program is one of a series called Challenges to Democracy, organized by the Ash Center to mark the 10th anniversary. Guaranteeing America's right to vote is, of course, a challenge that is fundamental to our country and one that we continue to face today. Tonight, our panel will focus on the range of issues that impact the right to register and vote, including the efforts underway to both expand and restrict voting and registration. It is my privilege to introduce our moderator who will introduce our panel for this discussion, Professor Alexander Kazar. Mr. Kazar is a Sterling Professor of History and Social Policy here at Harvard. He is a leading expert on election reform, the history of democracies, and the history of poverty. His book, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States, was named Best U.S. History Book by the American History Association and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Professor Kazar. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> And thanks to all of you for, for coming uh, and to our <coughs> distinguished guests. We're, we're gathered here really uh, for two somewhat contradictory reasons. The first, as I'm sure you know, is commemorative <laughs> or pointing to the little noticed formal subtitle of the Voting Rights Act. It's called, you know, everyone talks about the Voting Rights Act. It has a subtitle underneath the Voting Rights Act, which is an act to enforce the 15th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and for other purposes. The 15th Amendment, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, declared that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States uh, or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The 15th Amendment was ratified and became the law of the land in 1870, 95 years before the Voting Rights Act. So what we, what we have, what the Voting Rights Act is, is a piece of legislation designed to enforce a constitutional provision that had already been on the books for nearly a century. Now that provision was enforced briefly after the Civil War uh, in the presence of Northern troops uh, in, in the South. And African Americans actually actively engaged in political life in the South from the late 1960s, depending on the state, until the mid to late 1890s. But that begins to change in the 1870s and 1880s when a combination of violence, 
in, in a long series of legal devices led to the wholesale disfranchisement of African Americans. It's important to note, I mean, it's a, there's one historical point that, uh, uh, about the history of the right to vote that is, I think is worth really keeping in mind, uh, is that th this is, what happened in the late 19th century is one of numerous instances when the right to vote was narrowed. The history of the franchise in the United States is not a history of continuous exhibition. Although it did not attract a lot of attention in the very beginning, what Section 5 was designed to do was to prevent states and counties from changing their voting laws uh, and electoral procedures in ways that might be discriminatory after those states had been obliged by the federal government to permit African Americans to register. It was to permit maneuvers, strategies. Okay, now we have to enfranchise African Americans, but we can change district line, change procedures, and still maintain discrimination. Any such changes uh, had to be approved by the Justice Department or by a federal court. That's what preclearance was. To limit its intrusiveness in some ways throughout the country, it was made applicable only to those jurisdictions with a discernible history and pattern of discrimination. That was the coverage formula which was spelled out in Section 4. It was Section 4 that a narrow majority of the Supreme Court tossed out in Shelby versus Holder on the grounds that the coverage formula was no longer reasonable uh, or appropriate. Some of you may remember um, just, you know, Justice Ginsburg's comment that getting rid of Section 4 and Section 5 um, was like uh, walking out in the rain and taking down your umbrella because you hadn't been getting wet. Uh, and without Section 4, which is now gone, or which, is, which is the, the court basically said Congress has to create a new Section 4, um, the preclearance provision uh, became inoperable. The federal government, as a result of that decision, lost what for decades had been a key weapon in preventing states from passing voting or election laws um, that were discriminatory. Expansion. It's a history of expansions followed by counterattacks um, and efforts to prevent people from voting. There are different time periods, we can see this clearly. We are almost certainly in one of those time periods again now. In response to the massive disenfranchisement in the southern states, Congress in 1890, interestingly, and actually it was Republicans in Congress, but they, they, they were very different Republicans. Uh, Cong uh, Congress in 1890 considered renewed federal intervention to protect voting rights, but in the end it declined to act by a very, very narrow vote. They actually lost a cloture vote in the Senate by just a few votes. And, African, and the federal government effectively withdrew, and African Americans remained voteless and politically powerless for many decades. The Voting Rights Act, the point of this longer framework is that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was designed not to respond particularly to the conditions of the 1960s, but to conditions that had prevailed for a century. The legislation, the Voting Rights Act, much celebrated in many respects, was fiercely opposed in the 1960s in, ma in many quarters. Uh, the politicians, anybody who supported the Voting Rights Act was a communist. Um, it, pa it got passed a cloture vote in the Senate very narrowly, just by a few votes. But it was a, ver it was a carefully thought out, multi-pronged effort to use the power of the federal government to enforce the 15th Amendment and to permit African Americans to register and to vote. And it worked. Millions of people who had not been able to vote uh, were, were, became able to vote. One of the key prongs to this legislation was Section 5, the preclearance provision. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was a truly landmark piece of legislation. There's, a, there's lots of references to things as landmark pieces of legislation. This was a real landmark piece of uh, legislation that contributed mightily to the enfranchisement of millions of African Americans in the South and later to protecting the voting rights of language minorities throughout the United States. It's thanks to the Voting Rights Act and some other things that happened in the 60s as well that the United States actually did achieve something close to universal suffrage, which was in 1970, not in 1790, as some historical accounts might suggest.
The second reason we're here, which is a little bit of cross purposes, is that a critical part of the Voting Rights Act, the coverage formula and the preclearance provision, which I'm going to say a few more words about, was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2013 in the well-known case of Shelby versus Holder. The subject before us today and before us as a society as well as tonight at this event is what is to be done? What are the strategies for moving forward to strengthen and protect voting rights, not only in the wake of Shelby, but also in a political climate in which many states have been enacting procedural laws and requirements that place new obstacles, most vividly, most well known are voter ID requirements, in the path of many prospective voters. Before looking to the future, uh, I'm gonna try to give something of a historical framing uh, to this discussion because these, these issues have unfortunately deep uh, historical roots. And let me begin by mentioning